They are the elite. Drivers confronting the most punishing conditions. They are the new breed of test driver, mercilessly putting cars through their paces. Who are these masters of the road? Hello and welcome to Theme Park History, the channel for everything to do with theme parks, old and new, big and small. In today's episode, we take our dream car out for a spin as we explore Test Track, a high-speed slot car attraction that opened at Disney's Epcot on March 17, 1999. This attraction was suggested by all these crash test dummies, so thank you to everyone for the comments. As always, if there's any attraction you would like us to cover in a future video, leave a comment down below. You never know, your suggestion might be next month's video. A joint venture created by Disney Disney and General Motors. Test Track has guests buckle up for the ride of their lives as they put a test vehicle through its paces with a series of tests showing how automobile prototype evaluations are conducted. Technologically groundbreaking and forever game changing, the attraction has cemented its place as not only one of the most popular attractions at Walt Disney World, but also the fastest, reaching a top speed of 65 miles per hour. Unlike the other slow moving rides within the Park. Test Track is a non-stop, fast-paced, exciting experience that has ushered in a change to the park of the 21st century. It's the biggest, they say, the most beautiful, the most awe-inspiring, the most colorful, the most spectacular event of this era, the New York World's Fair. In a word, it's the greatest. In April 1964, the New York World's Fair would officially open to the public. Held in Queens, New York, the exhibition featured over 140 pavilions, 80 nations, 24 U.S. states, and 45 corporations building exhibits for attractions to showcase man's achievement on a shrinking globe in an expanding universe. Attended by over 51 million people, the fair would be remembered for the influence Walt Disney had, as he and his Imagineers were contracted by three companies, along with the state of Illinois to create attractions for the showcase of mid-20th century culture and technology. Of the four attractions created, the most popular was Ford's Magic Skyway. Presented by the Ford Motor Company, the ride featured 50 motorless Ford convertibles, which would take guests through scenes featuring life-sized, audio-animatronic dinosaurs and cavemen. The ride system would be an early prototype of the People Mover, in which the ride vehicles are always moving, and guests load and unload from the vehicles by a large speed-matched rotating platform station. During the planning and development of the Future World section of Epcot in the mid-1970s, Imagineers wanted to create a pavilion dedicated to all things transportation, but had trouble securing a sponsor. Unlike today, in which Disney covers all the costs to build attractions, back then the park would need to secure corporate sponsorships for each pavilion guaranteeing financial support and updates throughout the sponsor's contract. This meant Disney would oversee the installation and design of the attractions within each pavilion while the bill was passed on to its sponsor. In exchange, the sponsor could advertise their name and logo throughout the pavilion and also have a say into what went into the attraction itself. Disney would eventually be approached by the General Motors Company in 1976 about sponsoring the transportation pavilion. The two companies actually crossed paths with each other back at the 1960s World's Fair, as while Disney's four attractions were very popular, it would be General Motors' own attraction known as Futurama. 
Sorry, not the TV show. Bite my shiny metal ass. That was the most popular throughout the entire expo. Wanting to shut out their rival competitor, Ford Motors, from being involved with the new park, General Motors would sign a 10-year sponsorship for the pavilion in December 1977, making them the first company to sign a deal with the Epcot Center. Construction on the transportation pavilion would begin in late 1979. Early plans for the pavilion were to include two attractions, an Omnimover dark ride taking guests through the history of transportation, along with an outdoor attraction inspired by General Motors' Milford Proving Grounds, which is the industry's first dedicated automobile testing facility that opened in 1924. However, due to budget restraints, the Proving Grounds concept would be shelved and the entire pavilion would instead be dedicated just to the Omnimover attraction. Attraction. The pavilion is one of the largest in Future World. As the stainless steel clad Shape Show building stands 65 feet tall, 320 feet wide, and covers over 79,400 square feet. Imagineer Claude Coates would be initially responsible for creating the story of the attraction. When presented with a rough draft of the story, General Motors was said to be unhappy with the results, as they felt the script was lacking in charm and humor, and wanted the story to be more in line with other Disney rides. Coates would bring in recently retired Imagineer Mark Davis and and legendary Disney animator Ward Kimball to help create and develop a more humorous, light-hearted attraction. While Davis would be credited with most of the story's humor, Kimball would be responsible for the attraction's development, from its concept design to installation and execution. The attraction would be the first and last Kimball had ever worked on. The attraction would utilize a 1,750-foot Omnimover ride system that could fit four to six Six guests per vehicle, feature 30 show scenes and over 130 audio animatronics, the most ever created for a Disney attraction. Guests would go on a time-traveling journey through the history of transportation, including man's shortcomings and triumphs in designing new vehicles, the age of flight, and the development of the horseless carriage, as well as transportation trends pop culture latched onto like the bicycle, the family Sunday drive, and the summer road trip. The grand finale attempted to predict what the future for transportation would be with CenterCore, a gleaming, glowing, futuristic city, and Pepper's ghost illusions put guests into futuristic vehicles. At the end of the ride, Visitors would exit the attraction and head into the Trans Center, an interactive area about new products in development by General Motors. World of Motion would officially open with the rest of the Epcot Center on October 1st, 1982. The 15-minute attraction was a huge hit with guests, as many praised the ride's scenes and audio animatronics, along with its story and humor, making the history lesson on transportation a fun and interesting. One. World of Motion would not only be one of the most popular attractions at the park, but it's also considered by many Disney fans to be one of the best attractions ever built at Epcot. While World of Motion would be one of the most successful attractions at Epcot since its opening in 1982, the same couldn't be said for its sponsor. By 1992, the 10-year sponsorship deal between General Motors and Disney was set to expire, with GM having the option to renew their deal. Following the first Persian Gulf War and an economic recession, the company was struggling, posting a financial loss of $23.5 billion, forcing layoffs and cutbacks across the board. Unable to commit to a long-term deal, General Motors and Disney would agree to a one-year extension for 1993. After having a bounce-back year, earning $4.8 billion, the company was ready to commit to a new deal, but on one condition. To better help promote their own brand, General Motors wanted a brand new attraction to be built, one that would focus around their own automobiles instead of
of the history of transportation. Imagineers would pitch a ride concept that had been explored almost 10 years earlier for the pavilion, an attraction inspired by the Milford Proving Grounds. Just like General Motors does with its own vehicles, the attraction would put guests in a test car against vehicle testing required to deem the car safe for road travel. General Motors was ecstatic with the ride concept and a new 10-year sponsorship deal was signed. The timeline proposed would see World of Motion close, with the new attraction set to open in May 1997. World of Motion would officially close on January 2nd, 1996, and in a bit of irony, the attraction would break down midway through its final ride. General Motors executives were on board during the final ride and had to walk back to the loading area. The breakdown of the beloved Epcot attraction on its final day of operation in some way would be a sign of things to come for the brand new attraction set to replace it. Construction on the new attraction would actually begin during the fall of 1995, with elevated track work being built outside and behind the building. Once World of Motion closed for good in January 1996, Work inside the building would begin two months later. Everything inside the entire pavilion was removed, and a brand new 5,246 foot ride track was installed, making it the longest Disney attraction in distance. The attraction utilizes a slot car ride system, in which the ride vehicles go along a track with a bus bar fed down a central slot to guide tires and power which is supplied beneath, similar to the system the Disney monorail uses. Each vehicle weighs 4,800 pounds, has a 250 horsepower electric motor, and has six braking systems. Each vehicle has three onboard computers making 100 million ride system calculations per second, having more processing power than the Space Shuttle. Each vehicle travels on average 140 miles a day, 50,000 miles a year, and are designed to last for 1 million miles. For the finale of the attraction, the vehicle heads through the speed portion, bringing guests outside the building at a top speed of 65 miles per hour, making it the fastest Disney attraction created. The vehicle goes from 0 to 65 in 8.8 seconds and was originally intended to go 95 miles per hour for the outside portion. However, due to steep embankments and Florida's legal speed limit being 65, the speed was lowered for safety reasons. Early into construction of the new attraction, Disney would open the GM Test Track Preview Center, in which guests could see concept art and models depicting the new thrill ride stated to open in May 1997. The centerpiece of the Preview Center would be the 30 feet high, 100 feet wide mural painting by French artist Catherine Pfeff outside the building, which took her two months to create. On February 7, 1997, at the Chicago Auto Show. General Motors would officially announce the new attraction coming to Epcot that would offer a behind-the-scenes look at the thrill of automotive safety, Test Track. While construction on Test Track was still on schedule when it was officially announced, the attraction would begin running into problems shortly thereafter. During the testing of the ride vehicles, it was discovered the vehicle's tires could not stand up to the demand of the ride course and speed, wearing out only after a week. Goodyear, the company responsible for creating the tires, would completely redesign the vehicle's tires so they now would only have to be changed once a month. While the tire issue was eventually resolved, another much more serious issue with the attraction plagued Imagineers. For Test Track to run at the highest hourly capacity possible, a total of 29 ride vehicles would be required. There was one problem. The software for the ride system's programming installed for the attraction could only handle a total of six vehicles at once, along with other technical problems and weather-induced power surges causing the system to crash and take over an hour to reboot, Imagineers were left with no choice but to scrap the software developed by a third-party manufacturer and build their own from the ground up. 
needless to say, this was a huge setback for Disney and General Motors, as the attraction was basically ready to open, with the pre-show, briefing room, post-show, and gift shop areas completed, and even a nearby merchandise cart selling test track t-shirts, magnets, orange construction cone hats, and a foot-high version of the ride's mascot, Test Dummy Goofy. The opening in May 1997 sign on the building was quietly changed to opening soon, as Imagineers painstakingly programmed each vehicle one by one in order to get the ride software to run all 29 vehicles at once. This process would take over a year to complete, and on December 19, 1998, Test Track would soft open for guests and cast members. Even with the soft opening, the attraction was still prone to breakdowns and would only open for two to three hours a day. After four more months of testing, tinkering, trials, and errors, Test Track would officially open at Epcot on March 17, 1999. While Disney and General Motors have never revealed how much the attraction cost to be built, reports have suggested the price tag was $200 million and most likely even more due to the near two-year delay. Located within the Future World section of the park, guests enter the attraction themed to look like a General Motors industrial testing laboratory. As they make their way through the lab, guests pass by numerous stations in which tests are performed on cars and parts before being released, which are separated into two different zones. In the Quality Zone, guests see how General Motors utilizes various technologies in their vehicles and how these components are tested. While in the Safety Zone, guests see how brakes, wheels, airbags, suspensions, seat belts, and windshields are tested, including an area for crash test dummies to be tortured. Wait, that wasn't right. Uh, I meant tested. Guests eventually reach the end of the lab and enter the briefing room where they meet Bill McKim, the host of the attraction. Bill informs the guests they'll be taking the place of the crash test dummies, who have gone on strike due to unsafe working conditions, to experience the thrills that cars undergo to make sure they're safe. Bill explains the test schedule guests will have to endure while out on the track, stating while it all might be a bit extreme, the cars everyone drives at home are made up of 15,000 parts, and each one of them have to pass under extreme conditions before General Motors ever let it off the test track and onto the road. Guests exit from the briefing room and proceed to the loading dock where they board their six-passenger test car. Once everyone is on board, the car dispatches from the dock and ascends up a 26.8 accelerated hill climb. After reaching the top of the hill, the car makes a right turn and drives over different types of road surfaces, including German and Belgian blocks and cobblestones to test the car's suspension. Next, the car heads into the brake system, in which the car's anti-lock braking system is turned off and as the car tries to navigate through a cone course, knocks a ton of them over. The anti-lock braking is turned back on, and the car navigates through the cone course again, easily able to navigate the course. After completing both courses, guests are shown an instant replay of the test to reinforce how important the anti-lock braking system is. The car then enters the environmental chambers to demonstrate extreme weather conditions, passing through the heat chamber, which features 100 92 heat lamps putting the room at 140 degrees Fahrenheit, the cold chamber, which chills the room to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, and the corrosion chamber, where robots spray the car in a neon yellow mist. Exiting the chambers, the car's handling is tested next, climbing a set of hills with blind turns while increasing its speed by 10% at each turn. At the top of the hill, the car almost crashes headfirst into an oncoming semi-truck before swerving out of the way at 
at the last moment, the car enters into the final part of the test schedule, the barrier test. The car lines up straight across from a concrete barrier and starts to accelerate towards it. Before the car hits the barrier, a series of flashes occurs. It's not the guests' lives flashing before their eyes, but for their picture taken as the barrier opens, revealing the outside track and the true final test, the speed test. The car travels along a straightaway into a boot-shaped turnaround over an employee parking lot, taking a lap around the building with bank turns and reaching a max speed of 64.9 miles per hour. As the car returns to the loading dock, a thermal scan is taken of the guest and shown on a large screen. Bill informs the guests that completes the test schedule. The data from their test cars have been downloaded and they can come back to ride again anytime. Guests onboard from the test car and enter the assembly experience, a walkthrough environment giving guests the illusion they're on the floor of an auto assembly plant. Past the assembly plant is a showroom displaying the current General Motors lineup, along with the inside track gift shop, where merchandise from General Motors and the attraction are sold. It seemed like the two-year delay would be worth the wait, as the 5-minute, 34-second attraction was an instant hit with guests, as many praised the ride's theming, story, and thrilling ride system. Test Track would win the Thea Award for Outstanding Achievement in 2000, and Epcot would see an increase in attendance due in part to the attraction, from 10.1 million in 1999 to 10.6 million the following year. While Test Track would become a huge success as the first ever thrill ride at Epcot, its opening would kickstart a major change to Disney's approach to the park's attractions. Starting with the closure of World of Motion, other long-standing attractions would begin to close down over the next few years, including Universe of Energy in 1996, Journey into Imagination in 1998, and Horizons in 1999. While these attractions were designed to both entertain and educate guests, their 1980s-inspired architecture and technology made them very outdated. With a demand of more exciting, thrill-based attractions in the 1990s, Epcot would be forced to leave its storied roots behind to now become a park of thrill rides disguised as innovation. In a ironic twist of fate, the attraction that was responsible for the changes to Epcot would itself become a relic of the past. In a case of Deja Vu, the second sponsorship deal between General Motors and Disney was set to expire in 2009. Just like in 1993, the company was once again struggling, having the file for Chapter 11 reorganization in July 2009, and being saved by a controversial rescue plan involving federal loans, investments, and guarantees. Unable to once again commit to a long-term deal, General General Motors agreed to continue sponsoring Test Track on a yearly basis. On January 6, 2012, it would be announced that Disney and General Motors had agreed to a new sponsorship deal along with a major surprise. Test Track would be closing for an eight-month refurbishment in order to create a new version of the attraction. After 13 years, Test Track would officially close on April 15, 2012. As part of the update, Test Track's sponsor would become General Motors' Chevrolet brand instead of GM as a whole. While no changes were made to the ride track and vehicle, vehicles, the attraction's story and theming would be reworked. Instead of heading through an industrial testing laboratory, guests now enter the Chevrolet Design Center, where they design their own Chevrolet custom concept vehicle and test a sim car at the center's driving course to see how the concept fares. The testing warehouse guests previously rode through would be replaced with a digital sim track taking inspiration from the movie Tron. Guests board the six-passenger sim car they've designed and head out to the track, where it undergoes four different tests. Capability, efficiency, responsiveness, and power, viewing the real-time results after each. Test Track 2.0 would officially open on December 6, 2012, 
with the upgrades to the attraction rumored to have cost $60 million. Reception to the new version of the attraction has been met with mixed reactions, as while the ride portion is still praised for being the same fun and exciting experience, riders are split down the middle when it comes to the new theming and story. While the original test track felt like an actual modern industrial factory testing ground with a gritty and grounded but yet fun approach, Test Track 2.0 offers a much more serious and imaginative forward-looking perspective at what the future of the automobile industry could possibly be. That being said, everyone will agree Test Track 2.0 is just as innovative, educational, and most importantly fun as the original, offering the next generation of drivers a preview of what's to come. For over 20 years, Test Track has been a staple of Epcot and is considered by many to be one of the best rides ever built for the park. The attraction is a non-stop, fast-paced, thrilling experience offering guests an in-depth look at the rigorous testing procedures General Motors uses to evaluate its cars. Either when it was an industrial testing laboratory in 1999, or now today as a design center, Test Track is a must-ride when visiting the park, as it offers tons of fun while adapting World of Motion's original educational mission with mainstream appeal. So that is the theme park history of Test Track. As always, thank you for watching the video and supporting the channel. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and if there's any attraction you would like us to cover in a future video, leave a comment down below. Once again, thank you for watching, and until next time, don't forget to buckle your seatbelt, adjust your mirrors to avoid blind spots, and use turn signals when changing lanes. One, two, one, two. Larry, you know, this simple exercise can help you stay healthy, which keeps medical costs down. But you gotta do it every day, Vince. Whoa! <laughs> or you'll get out of shape fast. You could learn a lot from a dummy. Buckle your safety belt.